Welcome friends to this discussion on digital ethnography. Very recently I recorded a video on ethnography. So digital ethnography is almost an extension of uh, that. So let's talk about uh, the various characteristics of uh, digital ethnography and how do we go about it and uh, so on and so forth. So we'll see uh, in today's uh, discussion, we'll talk about how to prepare for data collections and cultural entry because we know that in ethnography it's important uh, for the researcher to participate in that cultural group. So how do we make that entry into a virtual setting or into a digital setting? How do we collect data and how do we create that data? And finally, how we perform the, uh, ethical research uh, in a digital ethnographic perspective and then uh, uh, conducting a trustworthy and insightful analysis as I call it. And finally, how do we represent the data analysis? So let's start today's discussion. So uh, there are various uh, ways of talking about uh, uh, digital ethnographies. One of it is uh, virtual ethnography or ethnographies of cyberspace, where internet is seen as a, as a separate space and uh, we talk about uh, ethnographies of that particular space. We will also be talking about connective ethnography or online slash offline ethnography. So how do people uh, move across their uh, uh, life in, in the online setting and in uh, offline settings. Then we have ethnographies of internet in everyday life. And finally, we also have a representation of the lived online experience of cultural members. So uh, the researcher uh, participates in that online experience of that particular cultural group and then provides a detailed representation of uh, uh, that uh, uh, online experience. And uh, as, as we can see that in all these uh, cases, the role of the researcher as instrument, the researcher himself or herself is an instrument there. So it's uh, through the researcher's authorial voice or through uh, the uh, researcher's perspective, we uh, get to see the uh, life of uh, people in the uh, virtual space. So this is a very uh, uh, challenging for, for a number of reasons because unlike offline settings where uh, probably the researcher is the only person who has uh, access to that cultural setting, uh, this is one setting where almost everybody has an uh, uh, access. So anyone with an internet connection has an access to these online social fields. So the position of the ethnographer as the sole and privileged witness is, is uh, more difficult to uphold and the authorial voice is also very difficult to uphold because everything is uh, happening or, or most of the communication is happening in a public space already. So we will talk about ethnographies as uh, immersive environments. So we will, uh, as we go along, we will uh, discuss what this actually means. So earlier, face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings or conversations or letters or phone calls were enough for the ethnographic exercise. But nowadays, uh, we have a, a variety of, of uh, online platforms. It could mean blogs, it could mean uh, Twitter accounts, it could mean uh, Facebook postings, LinkedIn groups, LinkedIn meetings, and many other kind of uh, social media meeting and communication uh, platforms. So uh, they are uh, uh, places or they are sites where the ethnographer can make an entry and uh, can, can get data and, and uh, very, very uh, uh, important data from those kind of platforms as well. So, uh, and as we all know, these online interactions are very complex because they happen both privately and publicly. So some, some of these interactions are uh, in the public space. Some of them may, uh, might be in some encrypted group or only allowed to uh, certain people. And they also take place synchronously and asynchronously. Synchronously in the sense that uh, it could be video meetings or whatever where people are interacting in real time and uh, in, uh, reacting to each other's uh, comments or communication. Or it could be asynchronous, asynchronous like uh, emails for example where uh, uh, one, one communicates and the other might communicate at a very different time period. And there might be numerous contributors too. So it might not just be uh, two people communicating. It might be more than two people at any point of time. So that makes uh, uh, ethnographic study in the digital space quite challenging. At the same time, this distinction between the online and offline social world is, is uh, uh, not always ontologically tenable because uh, 
these social worlds they cut across the complex networks of face to face and technology mediated communication these days so it could be face to face communication it could be followed by by a mobile message it could be followed by a video call or or or, or through a tweet or, or through a facebook post or, or those kind of things so uh, if one is using just netnography that is one one special type of uh, uh, digital uh, uh, ethnography as we will see so just the use of only netnography uh, uh, or just the traditional uh, ethnography would only provide us with an incomplete view. So it's important uh, for us as researchers to have a rounded view of, of uh, both the offline world as well as the online world. So uh, there are cases where one could do an ethnog ethnography without an offline component. But that is reserved for a phenomenon which are happening strictly in the online world. So it could be self-presentation on websites or it could be online word of mouth or those kind of things. So there we might go for what is known as pure netnography. Otherwise, the uh, offline component is almost uh, uh, as important as the online component at times. Uh, there are a lot of advantages we'll see as we go along. Uh, one of the advantages is that it is far less intrusive. The researcher may be present there and, and he, he might not even be interacting with, with the other uh, members. So in, in the traditional uh, ethnography platform, the researcher has to be uh, there either as a participant or as a non-participant as, as we've seen. But here uh, in the online uh, uh, research platform, one can gather a vast amount of data without even making their presence visible to the cultural members. So they might not even be visible to, to uh, uh, the, the members of the group. And that's where uh, uh, that is a concept which is known as lurking. So, uh, so that is also an appropriate technique in uh, digital ethnography. And we uh, go for elicited data and non-elicited data as well. So it could be where one uh, the researcher is eliciting data in terms of questions or interviews or, or uh, uh, direct communication or it could be non-elicited data that one can see on, on the blogs or, or websites or, or on Facebook posts or, or, or tweets uh, for example. So, so uh, in that way it's a lot less intrusive. Uh, and there are uh, a number of uh, 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 at least three different kinds of data which are available and there are different ways of uh, recording that data. So there is the archival data which uh, the online world by its very nature uh, uh, archives a lot of data through, through the search engine mechanism and, and other mechanisms. Uh, we've already uh, spoken about what is the elicited data. So one, one can uh, use the online methods and as, as we'll see that uh, the uh, online platform has uh, has a lot of advantages when it comes to uh, providing interview data for example and we also have a scope of uh, field note data and that's where uh, the the uh, uh, reflexive exercise of the researcher comes into play and there are various ways of recording this data so it it, it could be just uh, uh, plain copy pasting on on uh, uh, some uh, uh, word processing platform it could be just a screenshot one could be recording the screens and there are lots and lots of uh, uh, other ways of mining data, uh, for example. But for qualitative digital ethnography, it's important not to fall into the temptation of, of uh, gathering all the data that is available because here the uh, objectives are different. Here uh, the, the uh, way in which the research is carried out is different and the research report is also more about uh, description so this temptation to mine data it can uh, overshadow uh, one's real-time engagement and we must make sure that this real-time engagement is, is always a part of this research process so uh, field notes as uh, uh, we've seen earlier as well when when we spoke of ethnography they are uh, one of the most important parts of the uh, ethnographic research process so uh, there are certain uh, things that field notes should do and one of it is that it should document the journey of the netnographer from an outsider to an inside culture member so uh, uh, this this should be documented by the netnographer himself or herself and it should al also talk about an internal reflection so as as one uh, carries on interacting with the group either 
as a lurker or as a participant observer where you're actually participating in the uh, communication it's also important to keep your side notes where you, where, where you talk about your internal uh, reflections your in the moment impressions what were your impressions at that point of time when that communication was taking place and the uh, deep culture bound introspective analysis so that deep uh, culture bound analysis about that culture group is is uh, important uh, for for uh, uh, song, a strong uh, sociological uh, and ethnography as we say so these field notes are a very important uh, part of the data collection process apart from the archival and the elicited data that i just spoke of so uh, in this part of the presentation i'm going to talk about the uh, characteristics of the virtual world and the advantages of the internet platform as well so these uh, virtual worlds are regarded as object rich environment so uh, part, uh, participants can traverse and interact with uh, a lot of uh, various ways uh, for example it could be audio interactions it could be video interactions it could be animations it could be memes so uh, it's it's uh, object rich in that manner virtual worlds are also multi user in nature so there is participation from lots and lots of people there and uh, these uh, worlds they continue to exist in some form even as we log off so even when we are logging off from facebook for example uh, that uh, platform uh, with with other uh, participant it, it it continues so this virtual world continues even when we log off so one can't uh, Uh, get away from that enough and they also allow us to embody ourselves as avatars uh, if we can say or we can create a desired uh, 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 digital uh, identity for ourselves so uh, these are uh, from christine hines the principles for virtual ethnography and uh, Uh, she suggests she suggests a number of uh, important requirements uh, for for uh, 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 virtual ethnography and one of this is sustained physical presence in the cultural field site along with intensive engagement so uh, this is very important the physical presence is uh, along with uh, intensive engagement is uh, important there and also because this interactive media it questions the notion of a field site because uh, uh this this internet is is uh, both uh, uh, a site as well as it's a cultural artifact so so this this notion of uh, location almost becomes unnecessary in in uh, this kind of a mediated interaction so uh, this this has to be kept in mind by the uh, ethnographer so uh it's not uh, too different from offline ethnography one major difference is that they are just different kinds of environments and different ways of social co-presence so in the real world the social co-presence is, is, is of a certain kind and in the virtual world this social co-presence is of a different kind so uh, digital ethnographers have to uh, conduct a participant observation also just like in the uh, offline world and also interviews but they are through the digital technological uh, devices and uh, uh, the researcher must develop the right technological skills and and uh, the cultural skills and the social skills to participate in these socio technical contexts so these are no longer just social but uh, your 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 skill in uh, wafting through this technology is also a very important uh, component of of participation in that particular uh, environment so uh, it moves from a conception of location and boundary to one of uh, flow and connectivity because we know uh, in an ethnography it's it's about uh, one bounded cultural group which we study as participants but this one is of flow and connectivity so so it it, it flows across various platforms and the connections uh, are not limited just to the online world or just to one platform but across the platforms so so uh, uh, this this uh, boundaries are are explored uh, these cultural social and even ontological and epistemological boundaries uh, are explored through research in another video i have spoken about ontology and uh, epistemology so i'm not going into uh, details about this here so uh, one another important component is dislocation in time so uh, there is uh, uh, dislocation in time because it might happen asynchronously as we say so as as one is responding here the other might Uh, uh, respond at at uh, some other point of time so so that uh, 
idea of time time is is, is no longer uh, fixed also dislocation in space so one could be interacting with uh, people in in, in americas in, in africa in in uh, uh, other continents as well so so that is uh, possible for a virtual ethnographer to uh, interact with with people across space as well and uh, uh, needless to say it's necessarily partial because the richness of offline face-to-face -face interaction is not there that is why virtual ethnography at, at uh, in many senses is partial so uh, there are a number of perspectives of the internet one of this is that uh, one it can be viewed as a type of a place a space a cyber space where culture is formed and reformed internet is also a product of culture so it's a cultural artifact in uh, in that particular sense so online ethnography has to take account as we said earlier of these disrupted boundaries uh, it's also uh, it can be experienced as a place where one goes to so uh, so when we say that let's go on to the internet so so a space has a sp sense of presence as well and that space is is uh, not just limited to one kind it it could be an online game for example or it could be through one's discursive activities so when you take part in certain kinds of uh, uh, interactions so so that creates a, a space and and uh, one's one's movements through uh, various platforms is also uh, how one we can see uh, internet as so th these these are very important elements of uh, regarding uh, internet uh, as, as a place so uh, one imp another important thing that one has to i mean keep in mind as as researchers is the fact that internet is everywhere and uh, so uh, more and more of our experiences are mediated by this uh, digital uh, technologies and we virtually carry the internet with us, uh, us in our pockets uh, through through uh, our, our mobile phones so this reflexive understanding of what it is to be a part of the internet is is again again a challenge for the researcher so this reflexive understanding of what it is to be a part of the internet is is a, a challenge as i said so another form of uh, ethnography is the ethnography of the contemporary social world in a digital age so how do we integrate the internet into our ideas of friendship into uh, our ideas of who is a celebrity or the ideas of public sphere also for example or uh, or, or meaning making or or how do we use the internet as a cultural experience so this is another uh, form of uh, ethnography as well about the ethnography of the contemporary social world uh, we can also talk about an ethnography of the networked sociality so we are uh, uh, not talking about uh, one one single platform because uh, when when we talk of uh, inter internet related ethnography uh, uh, we we know that the research environment is dispersed across the web platforms and that is uh, constantly changing and involves both the physical and the digital localities so this is uh, very important uh, to to realize that uh, we can be uh, taking internet as a tool or a medium as well internet is basically dialogic so so uh, online cultures exist because people interact with each other through through uh, uh, through writing basically over time so internet offers unique ways of expressing the self and constructing social reality and that is why uh, studying the social world on the internet is uh, performs us with all these fascinating perspectives and uh, one major advantage of uh, social media is that researchers have access to vast amounts of data archived through forums so there are uh, archives like uh, wayback forum and all that and also search engines so this can provide uh, researchers which with lots and lots of information on on the cultural members their values and uh, and uh, uh, and various uh, communication practices so it allows us as researchers to decide which are the field sites that we should visit and how do we uh, make an entry into these uh, field sites as participant so this uh, research before entering the field sites is is uh, easily possible because there is so much of data already available through the social media platform 
So in the next session, we are going to talk about uh, uh, specifically how to do this in ethnography. So this ethnography begins with the identification of research topics at first. So what are my research questions? So this will help me in pinpointing the relevant online sites. Because before I make an entry to the sites, it's important for me to study the sites and their participants to understand what are the social dynamics at play. So that's how I start with. I start off with the research topics, which helps me identify which are the sites I should be studying and uh, how their participants interact over, uh, on those sites. So the first core principle of quality in ethnography is that of ethnographic citing. So we go site specific. So first of all, we concentrate to start with on a small number of postings or a very constrained data set to uh, gain a deep cultural sense of what is going on. So that's how we start off with and it's very important as I've said earlier not to uh, get into the trap of trying to mine as much data as is available because it's important to go uh, deep into what is going on the deep cultural sense of what is going on and from there on we can broaden in scope or we can deepen in scope as well but it's important to go site specific uh, uh, right at the beginning. The next step is cultural analysis. So uh, where, where one can be uh, uh, engaged as a participant uh, uh, in a manner which is appropriate to other community members. So community members uh, of that particular group. So communications are experienced, processed and understood. Experienced, processed and understood exactly as the cultural members experience them. So uh, on that particular site, we uh, experience, process and understand the communication as the members there would experience them. Uh, it's important to talk about the concept of the ethnographic timing. So uh, as much as possible, these messages and posts are experienced, read or interpreted and analyzed in real time as they become available. So this ethnographic timing is an important concept there. Then we have to make uh, choices about the entry. So uh, how uh, how we make an entry into that particular uh, uh, social media group or, or, or into that internet platform. And how do we collect data from there? So as we said, that data can be archival data. It can be field data. It can be elicited data. So that's uh, one choice that we make. Then we make the choice about the field sites. So which are the sites that uh, I should engage with? And then finally, what are the types of data? Because they, as, as we know that the online world is full of uh, 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 very rich data. So, so whether we uh, go for the uh, video data or the audio or, or, or uh, lots and lots of analytical data which are available. And then finally, we'll have to uh, evaluate the quality of the netnographic research. In my uh, last part of the presentation, I'll talk about the quality of netnographic research. So uh, uh, as we know that uh, to begin with, we have access to vast amount of uh, uh, data. For example, if we uh, search for the term netnography itself, we will come up with uh, millions of, of uh, hits there. So they are, they are archived through forums and search engines. So it, it provides us with huge amount of information about cultural members and, and structures. So, so from there, we have to narrow down and, and choose the field sites and plan the entry. So uh, which are the social media groups that I, I, I can uh, think about? So uh, making a successful cultural entry and you could have uh, one, one could notice this this spelling there. So that's how uh, it, it's used in an in, in ethnographic setting about uh, uh, making a, a cultural uh, making an entry into the field site. So this requires understanding the data while we are collecting them. So. Uh, while, while we make an entry into that field site, as we call them, it's important to have an understanding of the data itself while we are collecting them. And it's also at the same time important being sensitive to the needs and functionings of the uh, social media communi uh, community. Because if, if one is not sensitive to the needs and the way that particular community functions, then we will uh, have, have uh, problems uh, as a participant observer. So ethnographic research requires an initial and deepening cultural understanding of the community. So, 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 so the, those cultural barriers are not there. 
and then uh, the process as in uh, traditional ethnography is first of being a participant observe, uh, observer so participant observation allows the ethnographer to get to know the collective life norms values and dynamics of a group and that is followed by an in-depth interview so so that is a, a gateway to the perceptions and meanings that respondents attach to their own actions so once we have identified what what those actions are we ask those uh, uh, members to explain uh, 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 their their actions so uh, online in interviews have have uh, their their advantages but one uh, disadvantage is the lack of additional meaning when when uh, one interacts uh, face to face uh, through through the tone of speech or through body language or through gestures or through facial expressions so uh, when one is not meeting face to face but if this is a video meeting for example then a lot of those advantages uh, are, 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 are there but again uh, th this is uh, one thing that uh, the researcher has to contend with so although there are lots of advantages that we'll be talking about so these these lack of uh, social cues as we know them is is uh, one one disadvantage uh, one major advantage is that one can transcend these geographic and uh, time limitations so so one can interact with anybody across the globe at any point of time uh, especially over over email so these are the are the advantages for the ethnographic researcher and most importantly ethnography can leverage the connective power of the internet because uh, a lot of those voices which might not have been available otherwise are available because of the affordances that uh, internet has to provide so so a vast variety of virtual voices is possible uh, through net, uh, net ethnography uh, so uh, these are some of the unique characteristics of net ethnography it it provides us with an in increased field site accessibility so one has access to a wide variety of field sites over the uh, internet platform it's also increased communicative variety so it could be multiple uh, uh, platforms it, it 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 could be face to face interactions it could be uh, uh, emails it could be through through uh, through through uh, uh, messages it could be through uh, phone calls and and, and many other uh, forms so multiple online and mobi mobile platforms are uh, available for for the ethnographic researcher and uh, this this connectedness across virtual uh, uh, across multiple forms and fields so one could be tweeting at the same time the same person could be uh, uh, putting up a facebook post or having a linkedin profile or could be there on instagram and could be interacting on email or through whatsapp so all these uh, things are there and also the uh, process of auto archiving or much of it is archived over the internet uh the challenges are that of as as we've said before or we've identified before is that of data overload there's so much of data that one has to decide which data not to use and one major problem especially on the internet pl uh, platform is that of anonymity so generally uh, ethnographers have to uh, have uh, what we what is known as demographic demographic markers so when we interact with people uh, the, the, there are there are various ways in which we can identify them but this challenge of uh, anonymity can can be really challenging because uh, the the uh, online avatar of, of of that person could be very different from what that person is in real life so uh, this is uh, one challenge that the researcher has to contend with uh, so uh, after the data is collected one goes through the open coding process and the goal of the open coding is to reach a theoretically relevant understanding of the phenomenon of interest so it could be from codes to themes to overarching themes and all that and finally from those themes we make a hermeneutic interpretation to build a more general theory so once we have built upon what is known as the grounded theory then uh, new data uh, to test that kind of a theory are, are collected and analyzed and apart from these uh, micro perspectives we also go for more macro and holistic approaches in the uh, digital ethnographic process so uh, uh, in the last two slides i'm going to talk about uh, uh, what are the uh, uh, criterion on which uh, the ethnographic analysis can be judged so the first is that the analysis has to be internally coherent it should make uh, sense for the community 
it follows the accepted procedures some of which we have discussed today it recognizes relevant literature and the approaches it follows from and links to the data so so this this analysis follows from the data and is linked to the data the ideas provide new understanding so if after the ethnographic research process there are no new understandings then probably uh, uh, that that's one criterion that that one has to be aware of a believable sense of culture is presented so that sense of culture which is uh, believable to uh, most readers and observers the analysis is open to alternative interpretations that's also a very important uh, aspect of ethnographic research the text uh, inspires a social action and the analysis accounts for the interaction of online and social uh, uh, offline interactions at the same time uh, thank you very much